Welcome home to St. Anne's. We want you to know that you're welcome to join us at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Please be sure to hit subscribe to receive our sermons. We can't wait to meet you. Favorite gospel. Because nobody wants to hear the world sucks. But here we are. Anyway. So let's talk about it. Um, Because I think the Beatitudes are conveniently left out of all the Jesus is a superhero and all of our um, all of our secular Christianity where we talk about, you know, Jesus hates gays and, you know, um, women need to cover your hair. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. No, we don't. I know. We do not. We do not. Okay, so side joke. I'm always worried when I travel with this because I'm like, oh my God, I'm tra- if I get pulled over, I have a white robe with a hood and I'm carrying a rope with it. <sighs> anyway, let's talk about how the world sucks and how the messages that we are offered about what Christianity means and how we're supposed to live in the world are all false because we conveniently leave the Beatitudes out which is literally one of the only times Jesus sits down and says, okay, here's what I need you to do. And we're like, "Uh, scrap that. (laughs) We'll rewrite Jesus and say what Jesus really should have said, which is the rich and the powerful and the awesome and all that stuff should take over the world. And if God loves you, you'll have white teeth, a floppy Bible, and probably be really rich. And Jesus is like, yeah, never said that. Said the opposite. So um, let's talk about it. Because am I, like, really that crinkly today? I mean, I'm always pretty wrinkled up and crinkly, but (laughs) usually my voice isn't. Um, Okay, so our message today, actually throughout our entire readings, is what we think God wants us to be versus what God actually says we're supposed to be. So as a culture, and this is true of humans throughout history, but really today, um, God should be, should result in us being really rich and really powerful, having really great hair and good teeth and all these things, right? We, we love the prosperity gospel, especially here in Missouri. Ain't nothing like a good prosperity gospel get us all worked up. And yet, what our readings say again and again and again is that we are called to reject that. That we are called to love and potentially suffer for the gospel. And to give up. And to care about all people. To live justly. Walk humbly. Ooh, that's tough. That's a tough sell. I'm here to tell you, that don't preach. When I come to you and I'm like, oh, that's not going to preach. It, it doesn't preach because it doesn't feel good. And it goes so against what we are taught again and again and again in our world. And right now the fad at the beginning of the, the new year is how we're all going to do these things to be better, right? Um, the new fad, and I love this, I think it's adorable. We come up with a word, our theme for the year. This is my word, like power. That's my word for the year. Or um, I don't know. What are some words that people have thrown around? They're usually self-gratifying. Self-gratifi- um, what are some words you've heard? You've, you've heard this fad, right? It's all over the Pinterest. It's all over the Facebooks. It's all over the things. We've got a word of the year. This is going to be my word. But what if I tell you? That our strength is in our weakness. I stand up here as the most crippled priest you're ever going to find. Because we don't usually ordain people that actually follow the gospel or look like the gospel. We usually ordain the ones who, like, look and sell what we want to sell. I stand up here telling you that weakness is your power. 
Weakness is your strength. God calls you where the world rejects you. And that's tough. And I'm the first person. I've had this disease for, God, what, 13 years? 2009, what year is it? 12 years? 13 years? I don't even know. Let's not do the math. It's been a long time. I was actually, um, I will tell you some of the history of my diagnosis. So I was diagnosed. I realized that I was sick um, right after I took the GOEs, which is the ordination exam for clergy. And I was doing a big, um, a big round, so I was really, really busy at the hospital. So I was sitting for GOEs, which are so stressful. I literally made a batch of brownies every single day. I would sit and take these exams, which you wrote for hours. You would write for hours on these questions. So at the end of the day, and they're what, three days? I think they're like three days. Three days, right? Because, you know, the Trinity, let's make it hell for clergy. Three days. Three days of hell. I don't even remember. Um, it was my senior year, my last year of, of grad school. And it's like January. And um, I'm busy because, you know, I'm finishing up as a chaplain. Um, and I don't know if I've ever told you guys where I was a chaplain. Some of you know this. I was a chaplain at Northwestern Warren Hospital in downtown Chicago, which is a trauma one hospital center, which is why when you guys say, I don't really want to tell you this because I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you. I'm like, you will literally, I said this to my students, you cannot tell me anything that will shock me. You can't. Because at 24, I dealt with gang shootings, and they said to 24-year-old little white Meg, who's from Iowa, hey, we need you um, to be by the doors in the ER because they just ex they attempted an execution style right in the middle of his forehead, but he's not actually dead, and we think they're coming back to finish the job. In the ER, I'm 24. I'm as white as they get. I'm as Midwestern as you get. Good luck. Well, like, what am I supposed to do? Hand you Kleenex and be like, sorry for your, what? Anyway, so that was my, so can you imagine that I'm pretty stressed out in January? Because I'm finishing up this, this round, and I'm sitting for GOEs, and then all of a sudden, I'm preaching one Sunday, and I can't, this is in the good old days when I wrote my sermons, and you guys miss those days, I know you do, but it's okay. Back then, I wrote my sermons, so I'm standing, and I'm like, man, I just can't see them, I can't read them. And I thought, well, I guess I need new glasses. But I'm really busy, and I don't have time, so I'll go and I'll get new glasses when I return to Iowa. So I did. And um, I'm sitting, this is a huge long story, and I'm sorry I'm sharing it with you, but it matters today for the Beatitudes. It really, truly does. Um, and he looks at me, he's like, I can't fix it. I can't fix your eyes. So I think it's your eyeballs. So, but this is a really big deal, so I'm sending you tomorrow to a fancy retinologist in Des Moines to figure out what's going on. I said, okay. So, my poor mother. <laughs> One of us is going to cry, and it might be her, it might be me. I don't know. We'll see. So, we go to Des Moines the next day. This was so bad that literally every time I'm in Des Moines and I drive by this place, I flip it off. Wolf Eye Centers. I hate Wolf Eye Centers. Anyway, ask my husband, literally, if you go through Des Moines, I flip this place off. <laughs> okay. So I go to this fancy retinologist. He does all these tests, and he comes in, and he says, I can't fix it, which means it's your brain. And being a wonderful, loving person that he is, I'm 24, remember? Did I tell you I was 24 at the time? He says to me, well, at your age, it's MS or a brain tumor. Yeah, that's cool. I'm sending you back to Chicago because that's like the land of the best hospitals. Go back to Chicago, find a, find a neurologist, oncologist, and figure out if you have MS or a brain tumor. God help me if I didn't pray for a brain tumor. I did. I really, truly did. Because I went home and I researched it because I didn't really know anything about it. Well, you can do surgery on a brain tumor, but MS... You got nothing. So if, I'm not kidding. I really, truly hope that I had a brain tumor. And it took forever to get into an oncologist, but luckily somebody in my church was like, I'm going to fast line you. I know a neuro-oncologist. So I get in, he runs all the tests, and he's like, so usually when somebody fast lines, I think it's nothing, but yeah, there actually is something on your MRIs. Awesome. 
Um, so there's scar tissue right in between on the brain that controls your eyeballs. You don't have a brain tumor. We need to run more tests, but there's something seriously wrong. Awesome, let's run more tests. Because in medicine, it's a hurry up and wait land. Like, you're probably going to die, but it's going to take us six months to figure it out. Thanks. Okay, so they run all these tests, they run all these tests, and they said, okay, sucks for you, you have MS. Ooh, that's fun. Remember, I had been ordained a deacon, but I was supposed to be ordained a priest in, that ju in June. I'd been offered a position, but they didn't know that I was sick. And I know the church well enough to know that being sick and female means you have no job. You have no future. I'd already, I already knew that being female in the church was a rough thing to be. I didn't know that being a young female was a rough thing to do because we don't like young women. And now I was a cripple one. I wasn't that handicapped at that point, but we kind of knew what was coming. And I had this tearful conversation with the bishop. And I said, I don't, I don't think they're going to want me. It was already kind of on the line if anybody wanted to hire a rector at the age of 24 to run their church as a young female. But now she's handicapped. And he said, chill out, chill out. And if you just take a second, you know what that church said to me? They said, you're going to cure us and we're going to cure you. That's what they said. Now, I still have MS, and I will for the rest of my life. That's just the reality. But that church turned around, and I figured a lot out. I grew up a lot with that parish. Your weakness is your strength. The things that you want to hide from this world, share them. Because we hide so much, don't we? We hide miscarriages. We hide diagnoses. We hide crime in our families. We hide so much because we think if the world knew those things, it would reject us. But guess what? It rejected our Savior too. The world hung him on a cross and killed him. What I'm telling you is your weakness is your strength. Share it. The world needs to know that your weakness is where God calls you. Because guess what? It is your strength. It is. And it doesn't feel like it because it feels scary. And it feels overwhelming. And what if? What if? What if? What if it helps? What if? What if you sharing helps? And that is the Beatitudes. It's a long list of things that the world considers weaknesses. Humility. Being rejected. All these things. So what I encourage you, we have a couple weeks before Lent starts. I don't want you to choose a word of strength or how you're going to be better in the world. I want you to choose your weakness. Go through the Beatitudes. Which one do you think the world rejects? Which one scares you when you read it? Choose it. You've got them right there. Read through them. Which one scares you? Which one terrifies you? Which one makes you think, if the world knew this about me, they would hate me for it? Choose it. Embrace it. Pray through it. This Lent, take on your weakness because your weakness is God's strength. We want you to know that you're welcome to join us at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Please be sure to hit subscribe to receive our sermons. We can't wait to meet you.